Tom always gets up here and says, for those of you that don't know, you know, he's the pastor. Well, I'm not the pastor. I am, as it said there, one of the elders here at the church, Chuck Baumgartner. And I'll tell you what, that worship set this morning just, <laughs> and I'll tell you, I love that. That was wonderful, Mike. And the team, you guys did a great job. And I'll blur bear to my son, JT, that, that little lick on the, Guitar, that boom, 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 just, just, man, that blows me away. <laughs> I love that. So you'll have to excuse me for getting excited about stuff like that, but that's just great. Well, a couple of months ago, Tom asked me if I would uh, bring a word this morning, and God laid something on my heart. He, uh, scripture that I heard a long time ago, and keeps coming back to me once in a while. And I'm going to go back into uh, Exodus, uh, starting in the third chapter, and talk a little bit about uh, what's in your hand. Because God asked Moses that. I'm going to lay a little groundwork. I'll read from Exodus 3, 1 through 4, or through 4, 6. So a little bit of scripture there. Tom likes to read a little bit and talk a little bit. So do I. So maybe that's why he does that to me. Um, so I'm going to read a little bit, and then I'll talk a little bit. Now Moses was keeping the flock of his father-in-law Jethro, the priest of Midian. And he led his flock to the west side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire out of the midst of the bush. And he looked, and behold, the bush was burning, yet it was not consumed. And Moses said, I'll turn aside and look and see why this bush is not burned. When the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, God called to him out of the bush. Moses, Moses, he said. And he said, here am I. And then he said, don't come near. Take your sandals off your feet, for the place on which you're standing is holy ground. And he said, I'm the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face because he was afraid to look at God. And I imagine I can, I can relate to that. If God was to speak to me out of a, anything, I'd probably get scared. I would. And then the Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt and have heard their cry because of their taskmasters. I know their suffering. And I've come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians, to bring them up out of the land to a good and broad land, a land flowing with milk and honey, to the place of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, the Jebusites. And now behold, the cry of the people of Israel has come to me, and I've also seen the oppression which the Egyptians oppressed them. Come, I will send you to Pharaoh." that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. Now I'm going to go back to history a little bit earlier in Moses' life. He was brought up in the house of Pharaoh, and he was trained as a, as a prince of Egypt. And he had in his heart, really, to, when he saw the oppression of his people, because he was a Jew, he was an Israelite, when he saw the oppression, he had it in his heart to lead them out. He was going to do that, but he got caught up in some things and ended up killing a Egyptian and basically ran away and hid. That's how he got over into the area where God found him now. Forty years later, he's been gone. He originally wanted to free the people, but now God said, I'm going to use you to free the people. And Moses is maybe uh, calm down a little bit. He's learned a little bit. He said, Moses said to God, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the children of Israel out of Egypt? And God said, well, I'll be with you. And this shall be a sign for you that I have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall serve God on this mountain. And then Moses said to God, if I come to the people of Israel and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me, and they ask me, what is his name? What shall I say to them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, say to this people, I am has sent you. 
Now I'm going to jump down just a little bit here. I'm going to skip down to chapter 4 in the first verse. And Moses answered and said, But behold, they will not believe me, nor hearken unto my voice. For they will say, The Lord has not appeared to you. And the Lord said to them, to him, What is that in your hand? In other words, what are you holding on to there, Moses? And Moses said, A rod. It's just a stick. A little hunk of wood that I use when I'm out here with the sheep. And God said, Cast it on the ground. And he cast it on the ground and it became a serpent, a snake. And Moses <laughs> he jumped back from it. And the Lord said to him, Put forth your hand and take it by the tail. And he put forth his hand and caught it and became a rod again. That they may believe, may believe that the Lord God of their fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, hath appeared to you. And the Lord spoke to Moses say, and unto Aaron, saying, Oh, I jumped again, sorry. In uh, jumping to Exodus 7. Verse 8, the Lord spoke to Moses and to Aaron saying, When Pharaoh shall speak to you saying, Show a miracle for you, then you shall say unto Aaron, Take thy rod and cast it before Pharaoh, and it will become a serpent. And Moses and Aaron went in unto Pharaoh and did as the Lord had commanded. And Aaron cast down his rod before Pharaoh and before his servants, and it became a servant, a serpent, Blew. not a servant. In case you haven't noticed, I'm a little nervous. <laughs> um, Aaron cast down the rod and it became a serpent. And Pharaoh called to the wise men and the sorcerers that he had. You know, he had some magicians. and They threw down their rods and they became snakes. And so there's a bunch of snakes running around. Well, Aaron's serpent ate up the others. Yeah. I guess those other snakes weren't so uh, so great. But Aaron's rod swallowed up their rods. <laughs> and Pharaoh hardened his heart. And the Lord said to Moses, Pharaoh's heart is hardened. He refused to let the people go. Well, that didn't work. What am I going to do now? And God told him, take that rod you've got in your hand. And he said in chapter 17, In this shall you know that I am the Lord. Behold, I will smite with the rod that is in my hand upon the waters, which are on the river, and they shall be turned to blood. Now going through these early chapters in Exodus, God does a lot of miracles using that rod. You know, Something that didn't amount to much what Moses had in his hand, you know, sometimes what we have doesn't seem to amount to much. But God can take what we have. And if we surrender it to Him, He can do great things. So, in here, He uh, used the rod to demonstrate to Pharaoh His power by turning all the water in Egypt into blood. People couldn't have anything to drink. It was blood. And har Pharaoh still hardened his heart. He wouldn't, wouldn't let the people go. And so... He restored the water back to water. And then the Lord spoke to Moses in verse uh, chapter 8, verse 5. He said, Stretch forth your hand, or your rod over the stream of the rivers, and cause frogs to come up. So now we've had no water because it was all blood. Now it's back to water. And now frogs come out. And the whole land is covered with frogs. Now, I was stationed when I was in the Navy in a, in a place that was kind of wet. And I remember one spring when you, I was driving to work and the roads were covered with these little tiny frogs. And I mean, it was disgusting. <laughs> Plus, it made the road awfully slick when you're ringing over them because it's terrible. But can you imagine the entire ground? If you walked out of your front house and looked and the whole ground was covered with frogs, it'd be kind of freaky. But that's the way it was. 
Moses brought up with his rod by the power of God frogs on all the land. Well, needless to say, Pharaoh wasn't impressed. So then the frogs all died and they piled them up and they started to stink. And God told Moses, now smite the dust of the earth and it'll become lice. I don't know. I've never had lice. I hope I never do. But anyone that's ever been exposed to them, it's not a pleasant thing. And so lice were upon all the men and upon the beasts over the whole of the Egyptians. God used it. Didn't work. Moses said, okay. He's, his heart's still hard. Pharaoh's not doing this. So in Exodus 9, 23rd through 26th verse, Moses stretched forth his rod toward heaven. Okay, he's smited the water, smited the, du the dust. Now he reaches it up into heaven. And the Lord sent thunder and hail. And Now I've never seen hail with fire, but fiery hail. So not only was it raining hail, it was raining fire and thunder. What a mess. And there was never been anything like that before, and I've never heard of it coming since, but it smote the entire land of Egypt, knocked down trees, killed the grass, the herbs. Man and beast were beat. But Pharaoh still didn't let the people go. And so in Exodus 10, 13, Moses stretched forth his rod over the land of Egypt and the Lord brought an east wind upon all the land that day and all that night. And when it was morning, the east wind brought locusts. Now the whole country is overrun with locusts. So those are some of the, one, some of the miracles that God did using the rod, a little piece of wood, a little stick. It wasn't really a stick, probably. He was a shepherd at the time when God called him. So the rod was probably more like a walking stick. might have been five or six feet tall. It just, but it still was just a stick. Well, one more thing while they're on their way out, because eventually Pharaoh does send them out. We know the story about Passover when the uh, God sent the angel of death and it killed all the firstborn in the land of Egypt except for the Israelites who had the Passover lamb's blood on their doorposts. But one more thing with the rod. In Exodus 14, 16, now that they're going out of Egypt and they've got the army of the Egyptians behind them and he comes to the Red Sea, heard about being between the rock and the hard place. Well, they were between the devil and the deep blue sea, as it were, except it was the Red Sea. And God told Moses, lift up your rod and stretch your hand over the sea and divide it. And the children of Israel shall go over on dry ground through the midst of the sea. So Moses comes out to the bank of the Red Sea holds the rod out over the sea and we know the story. God divided the water and the Israelites walked through on dry ground. And after they went through, the Egyptians started to follow them and water came back in. Drowned the army. Now, we know that they started going through the desert places we know how God provided manna for him to eat. But in chapter 17 of Exodus, all the congregation and the children of Israel journeyed from the wilderness of sin, and after their journeys, according to the commandment of the Lord, they pitched in Rephidim, and there was no water for the people to drink. Wherefore the people did chide with Moses and said, Give us water that we may drink. And Moses said to them, why chide me? 
Wherefore do you tempt the Lord? And the people thirsted for water, and the people murmured against Moses and said, Wherefore is this that thou hast brought us up out of Egypt to kill us and our children and our cattle with thirst? And Moses cried unto the Lord, saying, What shall I do unto these people? They're almost ready to stone me. And the Lord said to Moses, Go on before the people, take with you the elders of Israel, and take your rod, wherewith you smote the river, take in thy hand and go. Behold, I will stand before thee there upon a rock in Horeb, and you shall smite the rock, and there shall come forth out of it that the people may drink. And Moses did so in the sight of the elders. So God says, take that rod, go over this rock, hit the rock, and the water will come out. And it did. The people had water to drink. Another miracle with that rod. Okay, now a couple more things I want to bring up that happened with that rod. They had a, got into a war with the Amalekites. And God told Moses to get up there and hold up the rod over his head. Tomorrow, I, So Moses tells the people, tomorrow I'm going to stand on top of the hill with the rod of God in my hand. And so Joshua did as Moses has said. He brought out some soldiers out fighting and fought with Amalek. And Moses, Aaron, and Hur went up to the top of the hill. And it came to pass... When Moses held up his hand, Israel prevailed. As long as he's holding up that rod, they were winning. But now Moses was an old man at this time, and I'm not as old as Moses was that time then, but I know if I hold my hands up very long, my arms get really, really heavy. And not only was he just holding up his hands, he had that rod up there. And his hands started to come down. As soon as his hands started to come down, the the Amalekites started winning. Get those hands back up. Puts the hands back up. Hold that rod high. And they start, Israel starts winning again. Well, before long, his hands coming down. I can, I can, I can feel it. I'm holding my hands up like now and they're getting tired. Oh, Aaron and her said, listen, I'll tell you what, we roll this rock out, you sit on the rock and we'll hold your hands up. So not only was he holding that up, but he had some friends to hold him up. You know, sometimes we may not have much of anything in our hand, like Moses had that rod. Aaron and Hur didn't really have much of anything in their hand, but they had Moses' hands in their hand. They were holding him up. Sometimes God just would like us to hold somebody else up. You know, sometimes we have a, a friend that, or an acquaintance that has a need, and sometimes God just would like us to hold them up. Maybe we hold them up physically. Maybe we do something physically to support them. Maybe we just pray for them. But we give them some support. We have that in our hand. We have our friend in our hand. Now, Moses used that rod for years and years as they were journeying in the wilderness. And I guess he got kind of accustomed to using it. Hey, something's going on, we got to do. I'll take that rod and I'll use it. Well, God gave him one more assignment with that rod. In Numbers, the 20th chapter... Now, there was no water for the congregation. Again, it's been years, but they come to another place where there's no water. And they assembled themselves together against Moses and against Aaron. And the people quarreled with Moses and said, Would that we had perished when our brothers perished before the Lord. Why have you brought the assembly of the Lord into this wilderness that we should die here? Both we and our cattle. Why have you made us come up out of Egypt? to bring us to this evil place. 
There's no place for grain or figs or vines or pomegranates, and there's no water to drink. And Moses and Aaron went from the presence of the assembly to the entrance of the tent of meeting and fell on their faces. And the glory of the Lord appeared to them. And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Take that rod and get the assembly together with you and Aaron your brother and speak to this rock. Another rock, another place. And he said, and speak to the rock. Before their eyes, and I'll give forth you water. And you shall bring forth to them water out of the rock. And you shall give the congregation and their beasts drink. And Moses took the rod from before the Lord, as he commanded him. And Moses and Aaron gathered the congregation before the rock. And he said to them, now listen here, you've been rebellious. Do I have to bring water out of this rock for you again like we did back when? And he took that rod and he starts beating that rock. He smacked it a couple of times and water came out. But that's not what God told him to do. You know, we may have something in our hand that God has honored us and used in our power. And this time, God said, no, I'm not going to ask you to use that rock to hit the rock, or that rod to hit the rock. I just want you to speak a word. And the Lord spoke to Moses, because you believed me not, to sanctify me in the eyes of the children of Israel, therefore you shall not bring this congregation into the land which I've given you. He still had the rod. He had done many things over many years out in the desert with that rod. But God said, this time, I, you didn't do what I told you. It's pretty, pretty rough. God really wants us to surrender to Him and do what He directs us to do. He may give us a mighty ministry. He might give us a, a mighty uh, rod, whatever it might be mighty talents, mighty abilities. But one, maybe he just wants us to be still and say, God said, bring out water. So, what's in your hand? God's more interested in what we do with what he's given us than he is with the actual thing. So now... That's what's in your hand. You might have something in your hand. Now, I'm going to steal a line from a TV commercial. Now, because i got another what. This one's, what's in your wallet? <laughs> We've all seen that commercial. Everybody laughed. I kind of laugh at it, too, because it's kind of silly. But uh, in Acts the fourth chapter, starting in verse 32 and going on into chapter 5. The full number of those who believed were one heart and one soul, and no one said that any of the things that belonged to him was his own, but they had everything in common. And with great power, the apostles were giving testimony of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them. I folded those papers over so I could get a hold of them. There was not a needy person among them, for as many as were owners of lands or houses sold them, brought the proceeds of what was sold, and laid it at the apostles' feet. And it was distributed to each as any had need. Then Joseph, who was called by the apostles Barnabas, which means son of encouragement, Pastor Tom preached on that a few weeks ago, about Barnabas, what a great guy he was. He was a Levite, a native of Cyprus. He sold a field. He had a field he wasn't using. And he brought the money and he laid it to the apostles' feet. God didn't tell him he had to do that. He just felt led to bring the proceeds from the field and lay it at their feet to be used by the church. And there was a 
couple in the congregation that saw him do that. A man named Ananias and his wife Sapphira sold a piece of property and with his wife's knowledge he kept back for himself some of the proceeds and brought only a part of it and laid it at the apostles' feet. Nothing wrong with that except he went up and he said, here, we sold some property and here's all the money. It's all we got, but we're going to give it. And Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and to keep back for yourself part of the proceeds of the land? While it was unsold, wasn't it yours? Obviously, yes, the answer is yes. And after it was sold, wasn't it up to you what to do with the money? Obviously, once again, the answer is yes. So why is it that you put it in your heart to keep some of it and claim that you were given all of it? You've not lied to men, but to God. And when Ananias heard these words, he fell down and breathed his last. And great fear came upon all them who heard it. The young men rose and wrapped him up and carried him out and buried him. And a few minutes later, his wife came in, said the same thing, and the same thing happened to her. There wasn't any, any requirement that he give all of it. There wasn't any requirement that he give any of it. And yet, he gave part of it and said, that's all of it. I hesitate to think what happens sometimes when I reach in my wallet when the offering comes by and I look in there and see a 20 and a 5 and decide to give the 5 instead of the 20. <laughs> uh, guilty. <laughs> I've done that. But I don't claim that I gave it all. Now, going back into the Gospels, Jesus was sitting in the treasury and he beheld how many people cast their money into the treasury and the rich people threw in a lot. You know, hey, they got a lot of money, they threw in a lot. But then a certain poor widow threw in two mites, two little pieces of copper. He said those two make the minimum. You know, I mean, that's the smallest coin really was the two. It was like... Two half pennies make a penny. That's all she had. And Jesus said to his disciples, Look, I want to see, I want to show you what happened here. This poor widow has put in more than all of these rich people. It says they put in out of their abundance, but she put in everything she had. So to say what's in your wallet, it doesn't matter. This woman just gave out of her heart. She gave everything she had. Everything she had. You know, we don't know who any of those people were. We don't know about her, who she was. It doesn't really matter. But we do know even today we're talking about her because she did something remarkable in the sight of the Lord. She gave what she had. Jesus said out of their, their abundance, the rich ones gave what they, you know, part of what they had, but she gave everything she had. Now, I don't think God's calling any of us to give everything we had in terms of our money, but if He does, it's up to us to do what He asks us to do. Okay, now I've talked about somebody that had a, a rod in his hand had some rich people that had a lot of money some that sold what property they had gave that money and one who had virtually nothing and gave it all but there's one other thing I've got to bring forth and this is in 2 Kings 5 1 through 15 because I think the principle that applies both to Moses with, his, with the rod and to the 
rich folks and the poor widow that applies to folks is what's in your heart. Because that's where God's really concerned is what's in your heart. Now Naaman, captain of the host of the king of Syria, was a great man with his master and honorable because by him the Lord had given deliverance unto Syria. And he was also a mighty man of valor. But he was a leper. Now we know in Bible times leprosy was a very serious condition. Still is really, although we've got treatment some now. But we don't hear about it near as much as they did then. He was a leper. And Sir the Syrians had gone out by companies and brought away captive out of the land of Israel a little maid, and she waited on Naaman's life, her wife, rather, and his wife. I'm kind of glad to see you back here, hon. Because I've kind of pictured, when I read this story again, I kind of pictured you, a little girl who was an Israel, Israel, Israelite, but she had been captured and brought, and she was serving this captain of the host of Syria, serving his wife. She's just a little girl. It says a little maid. And she waited on Nam's wife, and she said to her mistress, Would God my Lord were with the prophet that's in Samaria, for he would recover him from his leprosy. This little girl didn't have anything in her wallet. She didn't have anything in her hand. But she had in her heart a love for God and a knowledge that if this man would just seek out the man of God, would just seek out the prophet, he could be healed. And so she told her mistress, probably the only one she had access to, Nam's wife, Naaman's wife rather, that if he could just get to the prophet, he'd be healed. Well, someone overheard that and went and told the Lord, the Na Naaman, thus said the maid that's of the land of Israel. So somebody heard her, said, hey, here's what this little girl said. And the king of Syria said, Go to, go, and I'll send a letter to the king of Israel. And he departed and took him ten talents, took a bunch of stuff, ten talents of silver, gold, all kinds of stuff to send to the king of Israel to try to get his captain, his uh, general of the armies, get him healed. And he brought the letter to the king of Israel saying, Now when this letter is come to thee, behold, I have therewith sent Naaman, my servant to you, that thou may recover him of his leprosy. And it came to pass when the king of Israel read the letter, he tore his clothes, which they did a lot in those days when they were over upset, grief. And he said, How am I supposed to... <laughs> To heal somebody, he said, "I'm a king. I'm not. A, I'm not a prophet. I'm not a man of God. I'm just. He, he's just trying to find an excuse to kill me. It's because he knows I can't do it. And so, when Elisha, the man of God, that's the prophet the little girl was talking about, had heard the king of Israel, had rent his clothes, he sent to the king saying, "Wherewith how hast thou rent?" thy clothes. Let him come to me and he shall know that there's a prophet in Israel. And so Naaman came with his horses and with his chariot and stood at the door of the house of Elisha. And Elisha sent a messenger unto him saying, Go wash in the Jordan seven times and thy flesh shall come again to thee and thou shalt be clean. Now Naaman got upset at that. He said, I expected him to come out and call on God and do all kinds of mighty things in front of me and, and heal me. I've got rivers back in Syria. Aren't they just as good as that muddy old Jordan? 
Couldn't I just wash there and save coming all this way? And one of his servants came to him and said, you know, if the prophet had told you to do some great thing, I'm paraphrasing a little bit, but that's what it says. If he'd come to you and said, do these mighty acts, do some kind of courageous, you know, do something great, you'd have done it, wouldn't you? Well, sure. He says, well, so what's the big deal about going down to Jordan and dipping yourself in there seven times? Don't you think that would be, you know, that's what he told you to do. Why don't you do that? And when he went down and dipped himself seven times in Jordan, according to the saying, saying of the man of God, his flesh came again under the fle- under the, like unto the flesh of a child, and he was clean. And he returned to the man of God, and he and all his company, and came and stood before him and said, Behold, now I know there is no God in all the earth but in Israel. Now therefore, I pray thee, take a blessing of thy servant, You know, sometimes the only thing we have is maybe a word that God put in our heart. Just like this little girl said, you know, if he would just go to the prophet, he'd be healed. That's all she said. Sometimes God just gives us something in our heart and all we have to do is share it with somebody. She just told her mistress that There's a prophet who can cause your husband to be healed. And it it, it snowballed and he ended up going and it happened. So she didn't have anything in her hand. She didn't have anything in her wallet. She had the word of God in her heart. One of the Psalms says, Thy word have I hid in my heart. Well, God's more interested in what's in our heart than He is in what's in our wallet or what's in our hand. And in each one of those episodes of the hand or the wallet, it was what was in the heart that counted with God. So the word that God wants us to give is... Jesus said, Matthew 12, 34 through 37, O generations of vipers... How can you, being evil, speak good things? For out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaks. A good man, out of the good treasury of his heart, brings forth good things. And an evil man, out of the treasure of his heart, brings forth evil things. But I say to you, every idle word or you shall give an account of in the day of judgment. For by the words... By, by your words, you'll be justified, and by your words, you'll be condemned. The Lord said to Samuel, when he was, when Samuel was out to anoint a king for Israel, look, don't look on his countenance. Don't look at what he looks like. Don't look at the height of his stature. He's a big guy. Because I've refused him. For the Lord sees not as man sees. For man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. Romans 10, 9, and 10 puts a summary on what our words should be. That if you shall confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and shall believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. For with the heart man believes unto righteousness, And with the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. So, can we pray? Father God, I just thank you, Lord, for your word that says that we can be saved through something as simple as believing in our heart and speaking that that word that we believe out into the air, that we confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord and we will be saved. Father God, I thank you for your word this morning. I thank you, Lord, for the ministry of our worship team this morning that blessed our hearts, Father. And I thank you, Lord, now for your word, Lord. I pray that you would touch our hearts, each one of us individually, that, 
Lord, we would truly desire to serve you in truth out of the abundance of, the, of our heart, that we'd speak your word, that we would minister to one another, that we'd hold one another up, that we would give of what you've given us, that, Lord, you would uh, continue, Father, to bless your house, and, Father, that we would be encouraged to speak a word that might attract someone into the presence of your son, Jesus. I thank you, Lord, for this church, this uh, place that we have to come into your presence. And I thank you, Lord, for each one that's here and for each one that's uh, following us on Facebook Live this morning, Lord, uh, for each one of you that are in your homes, Lord, I just pray that they would be uh, blessed by the reading and the speaking of your word, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen.